All right. Well, welcome to and welcome back to the 510 Report, where we talk about industry news, advocacy, and general goings on. Thank you so much for joining me. I do have a whole bunch of stuff that I wanted to talk about. And the first thing I wanted to do is just clear the air just a little bit. The 510 Report is always going to be about news and advocacy and general goings on like within the vape world, within the vape industry. One thing that the 510 Report is not ever going to be is like a drama-fueled show. A few people have been reaching out to me saying, oh, are you going to cover this? Or are you going to cover that? Or are you going to cover like, oh, are you going to cover uh, Jay Hayes talking about Ambitions Vapor on his live stream and this, that, and the other? The answer is al always going to be no. Uh, that stuff doesn't matter to me. I find it the, mo the most unimportant thing that we could possibly be talking about in the vape climate in 2018. What I really want to do is just focus on the things that are affecting the vape industry. So no, I'm not going to be chiming in on certain topics like that. And I just want to say that the 510 report will never, will never be about vape drama. It has no place here in the 510 report. So with that said, speaking of general goings on, I wanted to share a comment that one of my subscribers left on one of my videos uh, talking about youth and smoking and vaping. And I just thought it was a really interesting comment, especially in, like I said, in today's day and age in 2018, when we have all of these public health committee members and all of these public health groups and all of these politicians kind of throwing their hands up in the air going, well, we don't know why kids want to vape. We just, it, we just can't figure it out. It must be Juul, right? It must be the packaging. It must be the flavors. I mean, why else would kids want to vape? It almost feels like they're so out of touch. You just want to pat them on the back and be like, they're there. It's it's okay that you're so out of touch. Like it's been some huge mystery since the beginning of time why kids do what they're told they're not supposed to do. But anyway, got this great comment from a fella named Gavin. Now I know I'm going to get some hate, but I would like to put this out there and put out some info. As someone who started smoking at 13 and then quit with vaping at 15, the reason that minors no longer want to start smoking is because it smells disgusting. I cannot tell you how many times all those years ago, I got shit for smelling like cigarettes. And when in high school and middle school, most kids worry about their image more than anything. As for the reason vaping is declining among youth, it was a fad. When I started high school, you were cool when you vaped. My senior year, that completely shifted. You were a loser to vape. I am now someone who is of legal age, but I wanted to try to shed some light on the high school and middle school scene as someone who was just there. Politicians nowadays don't know what it's like for middle school and high school kids. I don't know what it's like, you know, right now for middle school and high school kids. I can only relate to my experiences with middle school and high school. And yeah, I started smoking in middle school because of a peer pressure situation. I wanted to appear cool to certain groups of people. And so I started smoking cigarettes. It wasn't because of the advertising. It wasn't because of Joe Camel. It wasn't because of the branding. It wasn't because of the marketing or anything like that. It was literally because I wanted to fit in. And I get the feeling that Gavin is pretty spot on here. It was a fad. And fads now in the internet age are even quicker even quicker than they used to be. I think you're doing a great disservice to public health if you're going to limit and restrict access, adult access, to life-saving vapor products because it was a fad in middle school or it was a fad in high school for a very brief time. I think Gavin makes some pretty good points. And uh, of course, I don't support any underage vaping. No rational adult is going to support underage vaping, the sales of vapor products to those not yet old enough to smoke. No one should be supporting that, right? But on the other side of the coin, I also don't think that if a seventh grader starts smoking at the age of 14, that we should make them wait until they're 18, until they can get access to 95% less harmful vapor products. And honestly, I'd love to get your feedback as well. Did you start off 
as an underage vapor? Are you now of age? Did you continue vaping when you became of age? Please let me know down in the comments below when you started smoking because I have a feeling we're not gonna see a lot of answers that say, oh, when I was 18. Started smoking when I was 19 years old. I waited until I was old enough and then I made that decision and then I started smoking. So moving on from that, I did run across this article from the Independent Institute, which I had never heard of before. It seems to be a blog of some sort. It's blog.independent.org, but don't worry, I'll be linking to everything down in the description below. But the big headline on this is the FDA considers regulating e-cigarette juice. And one of the things that the FDA is always talking about is reining in the booming e-cigarette industry, right? And it always seems like the FDA is always under a lot of pressure from a lot of other groups to do exactly that, to rein in the booming e-cigarette industry. There's lots of senators and Congress people that urge the FDA in, in different ways. There's always lots of huge groups like the American Cancer Society or the American Lung Association, the American Heart Association, the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids, the Truth Initiative. These types of groups are always putting pressure on the FDA to sort of deal with or rein in the booming e-cigarette industry. And the FDA's concerns are always the same, that flavored nicotine products are going to entice youth to start using them and eventually move on to traditional tobacco cigarettes, which I just want to remind everyone, there's no evidence right now that that's what's happening. In fact, smoking and vaping rates among middle school and high school students are at the lowest they have ever ever been. But this, for some reason, is still a, a very intense concern of the FDA. And we're going to talk about a tweet that Scott Godlib sent out earlier this week in just a minute that I think is also really interesting. So the FDA, in an order to address these concerns that they're constantly, constantly under pressure to address, the FDA has started a vaping prevention campaign and has requested uh, certain information from a lot of vape uh, vendors, e SIG companies, companies like Juul, companies like JWell, even companies like that Miley Pod system, and they're requesting all of this information about their company, including stuff like uh, what flavors do you use, what are the recipes of your nicotine solutions, how do you market, where do you advertise, what you know, what advertising tactics do you use, what marketing tactics do you use, what was the reasoning behind your design of these products, why is the battery the shape that it is, why is the pod the shape that it is, and a lot of people think that this like simple inquiry of information from these electronic cigarette companies is just the starting point for much more vigorous, vigorous regulation down the road. The USA Today reported that the FDA is considering a complete ban, nationwide federal ban on all vapor flavored vapor products. I personally think that banning flavors in vapor products the same way that they're lowering nicotine in cigarettes is not going to accomplish the goals that they want. It's not going to keep youths from experimenting with things like this. All it's going to do is dissuade adults from jumping in and using less harmful vapor products. Now, the author of this particular article from the Independent Institute, Raymond March, had a really great paragraph that I wanna read for you now. Although lifelong smoking typically begins by high school, the 2014 National Survey on Drug Youth and Health finds that this trend extends back well before e-cigarettes were available. It is also difficult to imagine e-cigarettes are enticing younger generations to smoke when smoking rates are decreasing. E cigarettes first entered the market in 2006, but the 2017 National Youth Tobacco Survey mentioned above finds that the number of middle school and high school students using tobacco products decreased by 20% from 2011 to 2017. And I just sound like a broken record when I say this, but youth smoking and youth vaping rates are at the lowest they have ever been. And I think just that fact, just that they are at the lowest that they have ever been, completely negates the argument that flavored vapor products are going to entice kids to use traditional combustible tobacco cigarettes. That's simply not what's going on, and, and I cannot believe that the antis continue, continue, continue to rely on this sad, 
sad argument. I will be posting a link in the description to this article as where as where as well as where I get all of my information. I want all of my references and articles in the description down below so you can check them out and read them for yourselves. So shifting gears uh, just very slightly, I wanted to talk about a pretty interesting tweet that Dr. Uh, Scott Gottlieb, head of the FDA, sent out on August 23rd, 2018. Vaping may well be a good alternative for currently addicted smokers to help them quit cigarettes and reduce their risk, but I'm both surprised and dismayed by how many advocates of vaping criticize FDA's efforts to keep e-cigs out of the hands of kids. And that was just a part one of three. He went on to say, if we're going to preserve these opportunities for adult smokers for the long run, we're going to have to work together to do much more to make sure products aren't being used used by kids and don't become a gateway to hooking an entire generation of children on tobacco and nicotine. We have an opportunity now to put in place policies that can preserve these products for adults and advance a regulatory framework that allows them to be used as smoking cessation tools, but widespread abuse and misuse of these products by kids puts these opportunities at risk. The first thing that really stuck out to me in this tweet is that Scott Gottlieb, the head of the FDA, said that vaping can be useful for current adult addicted smokers to quit smoking. I don't think I've ever seen that come out of Scott Godlib or come out of the FDA or come out of most any politician. So I think that in and of itself is kind of a big step forward that they're acknowledging that at least, yes, these can help adult smokers get off of traditional tobacco cigarettes. And I feel like the reason why some, or as Scott Godlib says, a lot of vape advocates are against the FDA's tactics to keep these out of the hands of kids is because those tactics include things like prohibition, limiting and restricting adult access as well. If we're going to preserve these opportunities for adult smokers in the long run, we're going to have to work together to do much more to make sure products aren't being used by kids and don't become a gateway to hooking an entire generation of children on tobacco and nicotine. One last time for Scott Godlib, for the kids in the back, youth, Vaping and smoking rates are at the lowest they have ever been. So I think, I feel like, I get the vibe that it's pretty well proven that vaping isn't a gateway to traditional tobacco cigarettes. Limiting access to e-cigs, limiting access to flavored vapor products would be a gateway to traditional tobacco cigarettes. The data already kind of shows us that we're not hooking an entire new generation on nicotine and tobacco. We have an opportunity now to put in place policies that can preserve these products for adults and advance regulatory framework that allows them to be used as smoking cessation tools, but widespread abuse and misuse of these products by kids puts these opportunities at risks, puts these opportunities at risk. And I like how the very end of that very last tweet almost almost kind of sounds like a thinly, like a thinly veiled threat. Almost like he's saying, well, look, if we can't keep kids from experimenting with vapor products, then, then none of you get to use them. Buying something like a Juul is no different than buying a pack of cigarettes. If you go into a convenience store and you wanna buy a pack of cigarettes, the guy behind the counter is supposed to card you. And if you're not of age, he doesn't sell you cigarettes. And if you're not of age and he sells you cigarettes anyway, whose fault is that? Where does the blame fall in that particular situation? It probably falls with the guy who's carding people, right? That makes the most logical sense to me. So for us to sit back here and go, well, we have 18 and over laws on the books. We have 21 and over laws on the books. You can't be under 18 if you wanna buy a vaporizer and you go into a shop or you go into a convenience store and they card you and then don't sell you vapor products because you're under age, but maybe just maybe someone goes into a convenience store and they are underage and the person behind the counter doesn't card them and sells an underage person a jewel. Is that the kid's fault? 
Is that the parents' fault? Is that Jewel's fault? Or is that whoever's working at the store's fault? If it's a pack of cigarettes, it's whoever's working the store's fault. But for some reason, if it's an electronic cigarette, it's the industry's fault. Dr. Godlieb, the advocates of vapor products are not your enemy. We don't want underage kids vaping or smoking either. And I think holding the entire vape industry hostage, saying that, look, if we can't keep these out of the hands of kids, then nobody gets to vape. Restricting and limiting adult access to life-saving vapor products in your own words that will help people quit tobacco smoking, which is one of the biggest killers in the United States. Over 480,000 people die every year from cigarette smoking, and we have a way to stop that, but because you can't figure out why kids kids are so attracted to vapor products, you're going to just decimate an entire industry. It's kind of unbelievable to me. It's kind of unbelievable to me, Scott Gottlieb. Of course, the vape industry does have some responsibility in this. I definitely, I definitely, definitely agree with that. I think the best way to keep vapor products out of the hands of youths is to educate the parents and enforce IDing people. We ID people for cigarettes, like I said. We ID people to rent a car. We ID people to buy alcohol. For some reason, IDing is enough in those situations to keep youths from consuming alcohol, which they're probably going to do anyway, or to keep youths from smoking cigarettes, which they're probably going to do anyway. But for some reason, simply IDing someone to make sure they're of age to buy vapor products is not acceptable for vapor products. It's not, it's it's not good enough. That's not good enough. There has to be another reason for this other than kids are just rebellious and do what they're told not to do. So moving on from that, and I have a feeling this might run a little bit long, but I definitely want to get to this last story. Dr. Ricardo Peloza. We've talked about him a couple times in the past in the news and advocacy segment on the vlog, and I'm going to link in the description to Dr. Ricardo Peloza's Twitter, as well as this tweet that he sent out. A new study of my equip show that electronic cigarette may reverse the harm resulting from tobacco smoke smoking in COPD patients even in the long term. So Dr. Ricardo Peloza did that one long-term study on vapor products where he had smokers and vapors and never smokers. And, and I'll try to track it down and put it in the link to this description, but his newest paper that he's released shows that use of e-cigs or vaping can reverse COPD in smokers, in long-time chronic smokers. It can reverse COPD even over a long period of time. So this was a three-year study uh, with 44 patients, and they had follow-ups every 12 months, so 12 months, uh, 24 months, and 36 months over the course of this study. It was a group of ex-smokers, current uh, vapors that had COPD in the past, as well as a control group of COPD sufferers that were continuing to smoke as a control group. Anything vaping science related always, always, always needs to be compared with that which is caused Causing us harm. So it always needs to be compared with smoking. It does us no good and only creates these sensationalist headlines when the possible harms, remember that vaping is not 100% safe. No one's ever said it's 100% safe. I sound like a broken record when I say this, but it's tobacco harm reduction. So it needs to be compared to tobacco. It does us no good to compare it to non-smokers and non-vapers. Whatever risks there might be from vaping are always going to be higher than someone who doesn't smoke or doesn't vape, and that doesn't matter. What matters is the difference between the harm you're causing from vaping and the harm you're causing from smoking. So there's a lot involved in this study and I just want to read you the conclusion. And keep in mind in this context the term EC stands for electronic cigarette. The present study suggests that EC use may elaborate. Don't worry I had to look up this word too. It means take something bad and make it better. Elamorate, the more you know. Elamorate objective and subjective COPD outcomes and that the benefits gained may persist long term. EC use may reverse some of the harm resulting from tobacco smoking in COPD patients. Fantastic. 
That's fantastic news. That's science. That's fantastic. I think that's wonderful. Reversing COPD in smokers. Someone please tweet this study at Scott Gottlieb. Dr. Peloza is the director of the Italian Anti-Smoking Association, as well as a professor of internal medicine. And if you're not already, I would encourage everyone to go follow Dr. Ricardo Peloza over there on the Twitter. So I think that's going to wrap it up for the 510 report today. As always, I'd love to get any of your thoughts down in the comments below on any of the stories that I talked about, but I want to leave you today with a tweet from Dr. Ricardo Peloza from back in July. Let's hope that regulators, politicians, advocates, and anti-advocates gathering in New York will mark a historical moment for human rights and global public health. Vaping is part of the solution, not the problem. I couldn't have said it better myself, and as always, I want to leave you with CASA. Please join CASA. It's free and easy to sign up. They send you email alerts for calls to actions in your specific state or town or area on any vape legislation that is upcoming, that is up for a discussion, that is up for vote or anything like that. Please join CASA. It's super free and super easy. So thank you so much everybody for joining me on the 510 report today and thank you to Kevin Skipper for this little word of wisdom. You don't have to do everything, but you do have to do something. Let's get involved. Yeah.